This conference will now be recorded. Okay, excellent. Happy Friday. Hello, everyone. Okay, so another day, another group meeting. Um, really happy to have you all here this Friday. We're going to be talking about um, chapters 25 and 26, which is going to be laboratory testing and diagnosis and then um, antimicrobial resistance. So um, this session is going to be a little bit different. The pace, it's going to be a little bit quicker. Um, I don't foresee that we'll be here for the whole hour. But then again, I always say that. So don't listen to anything I say. Um, but it's going to have a lot more questions. So it's not going to be me explaining things as much. It's going to be more question based. Uh, so I hope that you guys have done your readings. And let's go again. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Will you advance? Perhaps. There we go. Agenda. Okay. So quick IP updates. I just have one. Our plan to see where we are. Chapters 25, laboratory testing and diagnosis, and then chapter 26, antimicrobial resistance, and then next week assignments. Next week's assignments. Okay. So just quick update. Leapfrog. So Leapfrog 2022 hospital resources are available. They were released last night. So you can see first release, April 1st, 2022. So for those of you, um, for all of our facilities that are participating in LeapFrog, just please know that this is now available to you. Um, let me see if I can drop the link in the chat. Uh, yes, I am talking. Yes, I am talking. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let me see if I can drop the link in the chat for you guys real quick. So this is extremely important from an IP perspective because it includes a lot of different patient safety components. But one of the things that a lot of your um, leaders may be wanting to talk to you about is going to be uh, the hand hygiene component. Because how many of you are aware that if we are participating in LeapFrog, we have to get, um, oh, did that link not work? We have to get 200 observations. Um, per unit per month, right? How many of us knew that? Yes, we've got some people saying yes. I do. Okay, so Eva definitely does. Um, but this is this this is really important. So this is a really important document for you guys to go over. Um, so you can see here when you get into your hand hygiene, um, it's it's basically going to be telling you about your monitoring questions, all sorts of different things. You've got your your materials. This is this is where you can cl click and get additional your FAQs, all of this stuff. Um, because the leapfrog is a very big deal to um, to our executive teams and to our facilities. So just please make sure that if your facility participates in leapfrog, that you go ahead and read over this, especially the hand hygiene section. Okay. All right. So week two. This is week 2.5. Okay. It's week 2.5. Not quite at week three. It's the in-between space. Um, so this, this, these three chapters are very important. Extremely important. So if you have not read them, please set some time aside to read, because they're uh, they're really key to you doing well in this identification of infectious disease processes section of the test. Uh, it's a lot of reading, I'm aware. I'm perfectly aware that yes, I'm asking for you to do a lot of reading, but um, it is what it is. So laboratory testing and diagnosis. All right, so basic principles, just really quickly. So sensitivity is the abil ability of a test to detect all true cases of the disease or the absence of a false negative result, which is the number of true positive results over the number of true positive plus false negative results. Specificity describes the ability of a test to correctly identify a negative result. So the number of true negatives plus false positive results. So this, we're gonna get into this a bit more for, for chapter 13, um, which is going to be statistics. And that, that chapter um, is a lot of work. I, I easily think we could spend just six hours alone on chapter 13. Um, however, we don't have that that kind of time. Um, but, but the great thing is that there are a lot of resources to help you understand statistics better um, for this test. All right, so concept check. Which of the following statements are true of tests 
with a higher sensitivity than specificity. I'm not going to read it out loud because these questions tend to be very confusing for other people um, and just for me as well. So go ahead and take some time to read it and then post what you think your answer, what the right answer is. Okay, so I've only gotten two answer choices, which is uh, which means you guys are able to narrow some stuff down. The only two answer choices that have been submitted are C and B thus far. So let's see if it's either one of those. It is B. So sensitivity, um, so B, which includes two and four, so patients require further testing and there will be a higher rate of false positives. So sensitivity and specificity are terms used to evaluate a clinical test. Sensitivity is the proportion of patients with disease who test positive. Specificity is a proportion of patients without disease who test negative. The sensitivity and specificity of a quantitative test are dependent on the cutoff value above or below which the test is positive. In general, the higher the sensitivity, the lower the specificity and vice versa. A test with a high sensitivity but low specificity results in many patients who are disease free being told of the possibility that they have the disease and are then subject to further investigation. All right, so who am I? This is gonna be a pathogen. So I am a pleomorphic bacteria. I lack a cell wall and I am surrounded by a plasma membrane. Because I lack a rigid cell wall, I am resistant to cell wall active antibiotics like the penicillins and cephalosporins. I can grow on artificial media that provides me with sterols or exogenous cholesterol. Who am I? Okay. Getting lots of different answers here. So I'm getting um, VRE, MRSA, Staph aureus, Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, and then three mycoplasmas back to back to back to back. And then another mycoplasma. Okay. Very good. Mycoplasma. So mycoplasma is a genus of bacteria that lack a cell wall around their cell membranes. This characteristic makes them naturally resistant to antibiotics that target cell wall synthesis, like the beta-lactam antibiotics. They can be parasitic or saprotrophic. Several species, species are pathogenic in humans, including M. pneumoniae, which is an important cause of walking pneumonia and other respiratory disorders, and M. genitalium, which is believed to be involved in pelvic inflammatory disease. Okay, and then I did, I think I just saw um, Patty. Patty, are you on the line? Patty Montgomery? Hello? Let me see. Maybe I need to unmute her. I got to scroll. Oh my goodness. Oh wait, I don't think I can unmute her. Hmm. Okay, well we have we have Patty Montgomery on the line, guys. This is amazing. She's um remember I I in the email that I most recently sent out, I included uh the information to join the CIC study group from Washington. That is Patty Montgomery. She's the one who runs that group. Um, out of Washington and she's amazing. So if you have not joined her group, they meet on Wednesdays and they go over questions. So uh, you guys should have her link to join in the, in the email that I most recently sent out. Oh, okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. Carla says, Patty Montgomery rocks. Agree. 
Okay, so we've got our catalase test and our coagulase test. So what do we use the catalase test for? What are we trying to differentiate between? For our catalase test. Okay, so I've got, I've got some people are writing staff and strep. Staff and strep, staff and strep. Okay. 10 out of 10. The Cali's test is used to differentiate between strep, streptococci, which would be a negative test, and staph, which would be a positive test. What about our coagulase test? And us, you know, infection preventionists, we hear, we, we know our coagulase negative staph. Uh, when it comes to our CLABSIs and matching organisms, we're always, always, always running into the term coagulase negative versus coagulase positive, or the worst, the absolute worst, when you're trying to see if a blood will meet for a pneumo, then you realize it's coagulase negative. Okay. Staph negative from positive. Okay, all right. So the coagulase test is used to differentiate staph aureus from other staphylococci such as S. epidermidis. Okay, so let's see if this works because I sometimes feel like I really run into technological issues here, but I think videos are really helpful. Only problem is, can you guys let me know if you're able to hear the video because I can never know if people can hear the video or not. Okay, so I'm hearing that there are problems with the audio. That's okay. It's a very short video. It's about a minute long. Um, but it just shows you, it shows you the catalase test and it shows you how it bubbles. I had to do this in my microbiology class um, and it was really fun. <laughs> I love I loved micro. Micro was really fun. It was a challenging class, but um, it was just so much fun. It was so much fun to get to be in the lab and do this stuff. Um, so, okay. All right, so true or false, you can use the catalase test to differentiate streptococci from staphylococci. Is that true or false? Is that true or false? It is true. That is correct. Okay, the next one is, Gram-positive organisms are generally tested for their ability to ferment the nutrient sugar named lactose. True or false? Okay. Mm, it's kind of split a bit. With this one, I have I have a lot of false, but I also have some trues. I feel like false false is is winning. False is winning. False. Okay, then we've got Pseudomonas species and Proteus species are non-lactose fermenting gram positive organisms. Is this true or false? Pseudomonas and Proteus are non-lactose fermenting gram-positive organisms. Okay. 
That is false. Yes, we know pseudomonas is gram negative. Um, okay, so a lot of the times people get really concerned about, you know, how much am I going to have to know for the test? Am I going to have to remember every single bacteria, what it looks like, um, whether it's gram positive or gram negative? And um, it's not to it's not to discourage or, or scare anyone who's who's preparing to take their test, but um, uh, infection prevention is essentially a field where when you're coming in, we want to make sure that you have an understanding of some of the basic concepts when it comes to microbiology. Now, with time as an IP, you can absolutely further develop those skills and um, learn more about it. Okay, and, and the thing about infection prevention is that there are so many different areas, right, that we need to focus on, whether it's management, uh, infectious disease processes, cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization, education. There's so many different areas that it's, it's expected that, um, you know, especially when you have some of these, some of our larger teams, that we're going to have team members with different um, areas of expertise or strengths. But as an IP, as an IP, it's very important for you to have um, a, a good understanding of the type of bacteria, common bacteria that you're going to see. And I'm, I'm telling you, there's probably not a week that goes by without Pseudomonas popping up somewhere, right? Um, whether it's Pseudomonas or Stenotrophomonas or Acinetobacter or Staph aureus or the labs that you're reviewing on a daily basis. I mean, these different types of bacteria are coming up on your list, on your task list, on Epic, on Cerner, on um, Theradoc, on whatever type of surveillance system you're using, they're coming up constantly. And so um, while you don't have to, I, I don't expect for you to be an encyclopedia and the test doesn't expect for you to be an encyclopedia. As you do your practice exams, you're going to see that there are these pathogens that continuously show up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and so it's really important that as you start to pick up on those patterns, your pseudomonas, your proteus, your hepatitis, your tuberculosis, so many of these questions are centered around bacteria, bacteria shapes, how it's transmitted, what you do to prevent its transmission. You have to know that stuff, right? Um, you have to know it. And I think that that's one of the, the reasons why IP is so diverse when it comes to fields and backgrounds that people come from uh, to become infection preventionists. We've got uh, people from the lab who join. Um, and my team, I have a nurse, myself as an MPH, a respiratory therapist. My associate uh, worked um, at the lab. And so it, it's really important to have those multidisciplinary teams because they can, they can really help um, each other out. But if you're a sole IP at a campus where it's just one or two of you, um, you have to you have to make sure you know your your microbiology. It's it's extremely important, and that's why I keep telling you these chapters of microbiology, laboratory testing, and antimicrobials are extremely important. And there's no way around it. You have to read it. Um, you have to read you have to read the information for the test. And obviously, if you're already a microbiologist, you have a, a wonderful advantage when it comes to this section. For the test. Uh, okay, so our lumbar punctures. Uh, so the purpose of a CSF analysis or cerebral spinal fluid um, is to diagnose medical disorders that affect the CNS, which include viral and bacterial infections, such as meningitis and encephalitis, tumors or cancers of the nervous system, bleeding like hemorrhaging around the brain and spinal cord, and multiple sclerosis. So this is this is an image of somebody collecting cerebral. Well, it's not an actual one. It's like a drawing of someone collecting cerebral spinal fluid um, from a patient. And and you do okay. So I I can't specifically recall how many questions I had on CSF on when I took my test, but they do expect for you to to be familiar with CSF. Um, the thing that I will tell you is try not to be um, too hard on yourself when it comes to remembering some of the interpretations when it comes to cerebral spinal fluid. Um, you definitely have to make sure that you review and that you study and that you try your best um, for the exam. But what I will tell you is that once you get into an infection preventionist position, so much of 
the job. It's not necessarily you knowing 100% of the information, but you knowing how you can find that information. Um, so you knowing who your resources are, like, like I will be the first person to tell you that um, antibiotics are harder for me to understand. Um, the, the mechanisms of how antibiotics act on different bacteria. And there have been so many times when I've sat down with my um, antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist and been like, hey, can you explain this to me just one more time? Let's go through the differences between our azoles. So voriconazole, can I use that for aspergill aspergillosis or can I not? It, it's not that they want you to, like I said, 100% be an encyclopedia, know all of this information. It is very difficult some of these um mechanisms are are difficult to understand um especially when you don't understand all of the like pharmodynamics and pharmacokinetics and all of the pharma things that you need to know um but as long as you know who you can reach out to it's it's going to be okay so for back to back to csf for our cerebrospinal fluid analysis so we've got four basic components that are considered which are going to be your color and your clarity your protein, glucose, and white blood cells, including your differentials. So that's your lymphocytes, and we'll 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 look at it. So you've got um, this is this is a chart from the APIC text. Okay, so finding the cerebrospinal fluid analysis from meningitis. So you've got your components. So what you're looking at, all the way over on the left, your color and your clarity, your protein, your glucose, your blood cell count, agglutinating capacity, and then your white blood cell differential, breaking it down into your lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils, and eosinophils. So for, for you've got what normal CSF would look like for adults and for neonates. Um, and then you're basically stepping into, well, what is it going to look like if I've got a bacterial infection? What is it going to look like if I've got a viral infection or a fungal infection? Um, so starting with color and, and clarity for bacterial infections, it's going to be cloudy. Your protein is going to be increased. Your glucose is going to be decreased. Uh, agglutinating capacity is going to be increased. And then you've got your white blood cell count differentials where you've got your lymphocytes decreasing, monocytes decreasing, your neutrophils increasing. And eosinophils are rare. Your eosinophils are going to be rare all across the board. For viral infections and fungal infections, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, as you can see, you've got uh, both of them that are looking clear to hazy, and the readings are gonna be very similar. Um, as an infection preventionist, one of the things that we um, highly rely on when it comes to cerebral spinal fluid is going to be our CSF PCRs. So our CSF PCR panels, um, which test for a variety of um, organisms. And um, what I will tell you is if you're ever unsure of a cerebral spinal fluid reading, um, you're not entirely positive of what you're looking at, you might be a little bit confused, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to reach out to your infectious disease pharmacist, to reach out to the lab to get a better understanding of what you're looking at. Um, but yes, you've got to study. You've got to study your findings in cerebral spinal fluid um, and what you're gonna what you're gonna be looking for. This is a different table. Uh, which goes over the different types of conditions. So, so immediately when you're getting questions on cerebral spinal fluids, you should already start kind of a filing system in your head of, okay, what are we going to be talking about? Are we going to be talking about um, bacterial meningitis, fungal meningitis, uh, viral meningitis? What, are, what does my isolation look like when I'm dealing with these different types of um, meningitis? What does it look like for viral? What does it look like for fungal? What does it look like for bacterial? Um, and that's that's a difficult part. <laughs> right? Uh, that's a difficult part because you have to make sure that you really have it in your head what type of bacteria you will need to isolate for when it comes to bacterial meningitis. Um, and so this, this is definitely a portion of the text that you want to study, that you want to review. You want to make sure that you know your Neisseria meningitis. They love to ask about Neisseria meningitis on the test. They just absolutely love to ask about it. Um, so you've got, again, your acute bacterial meningitis, cerebral hemorrhage, Guillain-Barre syndrome, multiple sclerosis, okay. spinal tumors, and viral infections. And this is a different way of showing you the information on the previous chart. Okay, so concept check. A patient's CSF analysis demonstrates elevated white blood cells, an increase in protein, and a decrease in glucose. The results should indicate.
Very good, very good, very good. Yes, everyone's putting B, bacterial meningitis. Yes, whenever the diagnosis of meningitis is strongly considered, a lumbar puncture should be promptly performed. Examination, um, examination of the cerebrospinal fluid is the cornerstone of the diagnosis. CSF result from a patient with bacterial meningitis include the following. Glucose normal to marked decrease, protein marked increase, white blood cells greater than 500, early may be less than 100. Your cell differential is going to be a predominance of neutrophils. Um, your culture will be positive and your opening pressure will be elevated. Okay. Okay, a nurse is concerned that she has been exposed to a patient with possible meningitis. Because she assisted with the patient's lumbar puncture in the ED and did not wear a mask, the patient's CSF gram stain shows gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. Does the nurse need to receive post exposure prophylaxis? So there's different sections to this question. There's different like things that are going on in this question. So really break it down in your head and figure out what exactly is being asked because there's lots of clues. Okay, so let's see, let's see, let's see. We've got lots of different answers. Everybody seemed to feel like confident answering this one, but I've got different answers and most of them are D, most of them are D and C. So it's stuck between D and C. So a nurse is concerned that she has been exposed to a patient with possible meningitis because she assisted with the patient's lumbar puncture in the ED and did not wear a mask, okay? Um, she should have definitely been wearing a mask. Uh, the patient's cerebral spinal fluid gram stain shows gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. So this is gonna be, again, one of the reasons why you need to know your common pathogens. And uh, they're, they're gram stain. So gram positive, gram positive. Is Neisseria meningitis gram positive? Or is it gram negative? Negative. Yeah, so, no, she does not need PP because the gram stain, the gram stain is indic indicative of fungal meningitis. Are you going to be using a gram stain for uh, differential, trying to figure out if somebody has fungal meningitis? Is that really one of the avenues that will go? No. Right. So the biggest thing when you're um, when you are working on this test is. And I always tell people this, I can't remember who gave me this piece of advice when I was in college, but. One of the um, one of the biggest things that has helped me be successful in certification tests is when I am taking a certification test and I'm really feeling lost. Um, and I'm really feeling like I'm not entirely sure which way I'm supposed to go. The person told me, always ask yourself, what do you know? So what do I know, right? What do I know about the topic that they're asking me about? What can I bring to the table? Because I may not know the exact answer 
I may not be 100% positive. I may not know if Listeria monocytogenes is gram positive or gram negative. I may not be totally aware, but you need you have some background knowledge, right? You you're in these positions in public health in infection prevention because you've got that background knowledge um, that can help you really um, break down break down the question. So the correct answer is going to be no. Um, she does not need PEP because the gram, the gram stain is indicative of Streptococcus pneumoniae um, drawing tools. I always need to clear this. Erase all drawings. Okay. And then normal. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Nope. She does not need PEP because the gram stain is indicative of Streptococcus pneumoniae. And here's our rationale. Meningitis is most commonly caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae in the U.S. A gram stain results, result of gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains indicates a Streptococcus species in a CSF. Meningitis caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae is not communicable, so the nurse does not need PP in this case. However, given the suspicion of meningitis, she should have followed droplet precautions while assisting with the lumbar puncture. All right, next one. Which of the following precautions should be used for a patient who is immunocompromised and suspected of having cryptococcal meningitis? A, contact precautions for staff, family, sorry, contact precautions for staff, family restricted from visiting other patients. B, standard precautions for family and staff. C, mask worn when within three feet from the bed. Or D, airborne precautions for 24 hours after antibiotics are started if the patient is improving. This is such an interesting question. Okay. <laughs> People are like giving me answers. They're like, no, I take it back. I don't think that's the right answer. That's okay. So when you're when you're working on your test, it's okay to have multiple multiple options floating through your head trying to figure out what the right answer is. Okay. So let's start with the first thing. Cryptococcal meningitis. Cryptococcus neoformans. Is that a bacteria? Is that a bacteria? Mm, okay, interesting. All right, so preventing deaths from cryptococcal meningitis. What is cryptococcal meningitis? Cryptococcus neoformis is a fungus that lives in the environment throughout the world. Most people likely breathe in this microscopic fungus at some point in their lives, but never get sick from it. However, in people with weakened immune systems, such as those living with HIV, cryptococcus can stay hidden in the body and later cause a serious, but not contagious, brain infection called cryptococcal meningitis. Okay, so CDC has lots of really wonderful, amazing information. Um, when you're, when you're, whenever, you know, it's funny because you're going to get... <laughs> You're, you're gonna get questions from staff, right? They're gonna call you and they're gonna be like, hey, is this infection prevention? And you're like, yes. And they'll be like, um, my patient has X, Y, and Z. And then they start asking you questions about it, about how it's transmitted, whether or not they need to be in isolation, this, 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 and that. And every once in a while, you're gonna come across a pathogen that you either, it's not common, you haven't really seen it very, um, very frequently. Um, and you'll have to you'll have to use your resources. So this is this is a great place for you to come and learn about uh, cryptococcal meningitis. But there are some key things that we need to keep in mind, right? So this is a fungus. Number one, it lives in the environment. Number two, you come into contact with it by being out in the environment. It's in soil. Like you're you're coming into contact with those fungal spores at some point, and it's telling you that it's not contagious, right? So again. It's a common theme for this test. They want to know 
that you as an infection preventionist understand what these common pathogens are in healthcare, how they're transmitted, and what you can do to prevent the transmission of these pathogens. So with that being said, our correct answer is going to be standard precautions for family and staff because this isn't this is not um, contagious, right? So um, standard precautions would be appropriate, but but if you at minimum, if you at minimum can ask yourself, okay, what do I know about Cryptococcus neoformans? Is that a bacteria? Is that a fungus? If you can at least have the basic concept that it's a fungus down and that it lives in the environment, you can kind of take it from there and try to start dwindling down your answers, right? Um, because if you know it's a fungus, you can immediately cross off D. So this test is all about increasing your chances of passing and making sure that you can reduce the number of answer choices because that gives you a better chance of scoring higher. Uh, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna dive into that. All right. Next concept check, a 19-year-old female UCF student presents to the ED at ORMC with a high fever and respiratory issues. The patient became hypoxic and required immediate intubation prior to being transferred to the ICU. Her chest x-ray revealed airspace disease, most likely being a pneumonia. Bronchoscopies performed in the gram stain reveals gram-negative diplococci. The attending calls you to assist both the employee who cared for this patient and her contacts. Those in need of prophylaxis following this exposure to this patient are Okay, so again, we're on our meningitis train. We are on our meningitis train. All of our questions are dealing with patients who we are suspecting for meningitis, right? Because we just went over our cerebral spinal fluids, talking about meningitis, patient that needs to be intubated emergently. She's coming in, presenting all sorts of weird, hypoxic. It's, it's a situation, okay? Um, so. We've gotten a lot of answers, and the majority of our answers are C. So, the majority of our group is saying C. The EMT who suctioned the patient, the physician who intubated the patient, and the patient's boyfriend. Um, I remember when I was in Epi, um, there was our lead epidemiologist, uh, Jennifer Jackson, she's amazing. But whenever I came to Niceria meningitis, she would always be, she would always tell us, it's close contact, it's close contact. Remember, kissy, kissy, kissy. <laughs> like, it's somebody that like has to be very, very close to, uh, very close to the person, very close to the patient. Um, and so when we're considering uh, a gram stain that's negative and it's showing diplococci, um, we're immediately thinking of, okay, could this potentially be Niceria meningitis? Um, so, We've got the answer choice is going to be the EMT who suctioned the patient, the physician who intubated the patient, and the patient's boyfriend. So our rationale, Neisseria meningitis is a leading cause of bacterial meningitis and sepsis. Occupationally acquired meningococcal disease outside of the laboratory is rarely reported, perhaps in part because of the rapid use of post-exposure prophylaxis. Transmission of Neisseria meningitis to healthcare personnel has occurred. However, um, after unprotected exposure to infected patients during endotracheal intubation, airway suctioning, 
um, and oxygen administration. CDC's advisory committee on immunization practices recommends post-exposure prophylaxis for close contacts of patients with meningococcal disease. ACIP defines close contact for PEP as household members, child care center, child care center personnel, persons directly exposed to the patient's oral secretions, for example, by kissing, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, endotracheal intubation, or endotracheal tube management. And all of this stuff, right? Endotracheal intubation, um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, um, this is stuff now that, that for a lot of our facilities, facilities are, is falling under our AGP policies, under our aerosol generating procedure policies. Okay, antimicrobial resistance, chapter 26. Where am I on time? Oh my goodness. We need to pick it up. All right, antimicrobial resistance. So antimicrobial use is the main selective pressure responsible for the increasing drug resistance seen in hospitals. To have an impact on antimicrobial use so as to reduce resistance, infection preventionists need a working knowledge of the following. A working knowledge of the following, okay? Again, remember, it is a working knowledge, not that you have to be an expert, but you need to have a working knowledge of available antimicrobials, principles for their appropriate use, the mechanisms by which these drugs inhibit microbial growth, and mechanisms by which the organisms develop resistance. I will tell you, pharmacology is definitely difficult. It's okay if you don't fully understand all of the concepts. They just want you to know the basics, have a working knowledge of what you're of what you're dealing with. I will tell you that there are many times when I'm working up an HAI, like if I've if I if I see that I've met criteria for something, um, Clavsi, Caudi, etc. I I reach out to my pharmacy team a lot and I ask them, hey. Can you review this case with me? Did we were there any opportunities? And I'll and I'll specifically ask like, oh, did we have um, was there was this antifungal appropriate? Um, especially with antifungals because I, there's just I just get confused to be completely transparent. And so it's okay to not know everything. You just got to know the basics. Key concepts: more needs to be done to control how antimicrobials are commonly used. Agree. Antimicrobial stewardship is the best investment for preventing the proliferation of multidrug resistant organisms. An IT biogram is a useful tool for IPs to determine the status of strategies in place to reduce MDROs and that multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach is necessary. So infection control, infectious diseases, microbiology, pharmacy, all of these departments have to work really really closely um, to come up with different policies, uh, different ways of looking at antimicrobial use, what are what what are we using? Where are our cost savings? What are we doing to you know limit limit um, our multidrug resistant organisms uh, in our facilities? Okay, so antimicrobial mechanisms. So um, this is from the APIC modules. So if if you're preparing for your tests, well, one of the things that I definitely recommend is looking at the um, APIC modules that the Association for Professionals in Infection Control has. It's got really great content, lots of lots of amazing, amazing things. So an antimicrobial is a substance that inhibits or kill, kills microbes. Most are administered by intravenous or oral routes. Antimicrobials that actively kill organisms may be bactericidal or fungicidal. Antimicrobials that only arrest the growth of organisms and assist the host's immune system, including the infection, are bacteriostatic or fungistatic. So three types of antimicrobial mechanisms. Antifungals are alter permeability of fungal membrane, inhibit membrane biosynthesis or DNA synthesis. Antivirals inhibit formation of DNA precursors, DNA polymerase and HIV reverse, reverse transcription. They interfere with viral uncoating or confer viral resistance on uninfected cells. And antibacterials interfere with cell wall biosynthesis inhibit bacterial ribosomes, interfere with DNA replication or RNA transcription, or inhibit metabolic pathways. And then it goes into different, um, different um, uh, medications, beta-lactam drugs, fluoroquinolones, macrolides, aminoglycosides. So our classes, our different classes. Okay, so beta-lactam drugs. Beta-lactam drugs possess bactericidal activity, by inhibiting cell wall synthesis like penicillin, cephalosporins, monobactams, and carbapenems. 
Fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones inhibit bacterial enzymes, which are important in DNA replication, such as ciprofloxacin. That's going to be the most common. Macrolides. Macrolides inhibit protein synthesis, mostly bacteriostatic. Therefore, these are used for less serious infection, so acithromycin. And then aminoglycosides, like argentamycin, um, act at the site of bacterial ribosomes. It is used for combination therapy for serious or multi-drug resistant infections. And that's your gentamicin there, your, your aminoglycosides. Um, and I think this is this is really important when we when in a, a couple slides you're going to see a resistance pattern, and you'll see one of the medications that this that the bacteria has um, have been producing pseudomonas was susceptible to is amikacin, which is one of our aminoglycosides. So antimicrobial susceptibility testing. We've got our dis diffusion, our Kirby Bauer method. Um, bacteria spread in a lawn fashion onto Mueller and agar. Paper discs impregnated with a standard amount of antibiotic are placed onto the agar surface. The agar plate is incubated overnight, and then organism growth is either inhibited by the concentration of the antibiotic in the agar or not. And that's where you're going to have your zone of inhibition, an area in which the concentration of the antibiotic prohibits the growth of the organism. So again, your zone of inhibition is an area in which the concentration of the antibiotic prohibits the growth of the organism. So this is an example of our Kirby Bauer method. So can you guys type in an antibiotic that this um, that this bug that e. Coli, that this E. coli that they played in is resistant to? It's resistant to multiple ones. <laughs> um, but just some names. Okay, I'm getting penicillin. Vancomycin, bacitracin. Okay, yeah, very good. So, you, so you can see that with um, our antibiotics that actually are able to inhibit growth, you've got that zone of inhibition, and that some of these antibiotics work better than others, right? So, the zone of inhibition it measures is measured and then compared to the Clinical Laboratory Standard Institutes or CLSI guidelines for interpretation. So, S is for susceptible, indicating the antimicrobial agent may be effective against the identified pathogen. I is intermediate, indicating the antimicrobial agent may be less effective than an antimicrobial agent with a susceptible result. And then uh, R, R, indicating the antimicrobial agent should not be used for therapy because it's going to be resistant. So um, this was one of the um, organisms, so uh, VIM producing pseudomonas. This is what the susceptibility pattern looked like for that, for that organism. So you can see, look at all of this resistance. Look at all of this resistance. Susceptible only to colistin and amicacin. Yeah, this is pretty intense. This is this is a, a for reals for realsies um, susceptibility pattern. So it's definitely um, it's definitely a mean one, a mean one. So this was uh, the the vim producing pseudomonas that we worked with when we were working uh, when Danielle and I, Danielle Rankin, um, were working on a on an outbreak involving vim producing pseudomonas. So understanding this stuff is important because when you're reviewing your labs, right? As you're going through your lists, as your as your surveillance systems are pulling pathogens in and bringing them to you and letting you know, like, hey, you need to take a look at this. This looks like it could be of concern, or um, you've got a positive culture. As an IP, you have to have the ability of going in and and having those critical thinking skills of saying, oh, I have a positive culture. Let me open up my micro. Let me look at my susceptibilities. Let me see at what I'm dealing with. Um, and there's been times when um, I've had to call the lab and I've been like, hey, I'm reviewing this result and it's not um, it's not telling me that this is a multidrug resistant organism or it's not, you know, it's not populating correctly. And there have been times when the lab has been able to say, hey, yeah, that's that's an error on our part. But the same way that they say, oh, that's an error on our part, they've been able to say, oh, wait, let me educate you on why this didn't pop up as a multidrug resistant organism or why this didn't pop up as a CRE. And they're able to explain uh, the different types of antibiotics that um, bacteria are intrinsically uh, resistant to, and there's that opportunity for education. There's, there's always opportunities for growth and education. 
So with our antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, it determines the correct antimicrobial therapy, the, adamant, the adequate amount of appropriate antimicrobial and exact organisms in outbreak or cases of multiple transmission. So you're going to have your dis diffusion, your broth dilution, your E-test, beta-lactamase detection, dis approximation test, and other tests that you need to be familiar with. Okay, we're wrapping up here. So specimen collection and transport. Care should be taken when collecting and transporting specimens. So specimens should be collected aseptically and placed in a sterile container. Some specimens may be placed directly on culture media, like blood cultures, genital cultures. Uh, there's special handling techniques that may be necessary for some specimen, like anaerobic cultures. Prompt delivery is essential, so getting things to the lab quickly is extremely, extremely important. If transport is delayed, some specimens may be refrigerated. So this is important. Your specimen collection and transportation guidelines, how to properly do this, will be on the test. Guaranteed, 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 guaranteed. So you have to know this. Uh, so if transport is delayed, some specimens may be refrigerated, like urine, stool, or sputum. And others should be maintained at room temperature, like genital, um, genital specimens, eye, and spinal fluid. One of my favorite, this is one of my favorite slides. It's when it comes to microbiologic environmental sampling. Um, so let me paint the picture. It's back in 2017. I'm just fresh on the scene, okay? Just starting to realize that I really love infection prevention and I'm and I'm working with one of my closest friends, Danielle, on this outbreak. And we get the opportunity of a lifetime to collaborate on this outbreak investigation with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm just like freaking out internally, right? And externally. <laughs> fangirling, okay, 2017. Um, and I remember they sent out this team of just these amazing, intelligent, strong women um, to help us with this outbreak. And I will never forget when it came to the environmental testing portion. It was, and I was just like, let's swab everything. <laughs> like, I want to swab. I want to swab it all. Like, it could be anywhere, right? This thing could be anywhere. It could be growing in the ceiling tiles. Let's just, like, swab everything. And I got this, just this amazing moment of, of mentorship from Heather Moulton Meisner, who works, Dr. Heather Moulton Meisner at CDC. And she said, she said to me, she said, you never just randomly sample. She was like, you always let your data guide you. The data has to be your compass. It has to be the thing that's guiding your environmental sampling. Um, and I have never forgotten that. And um, it's it's probably been one of my uh, one of my favorite pieces of advice that I've ever received um, because it really uh, it really brought into perspective the importance of thorough epidemiologic investigations of um, your analysis, the analysis of your data, the collection of your data, the way that you look at the information that, that you're collecting and, and, how you, and how you run an outbreak investigation. Um, and it was extremely, extremely helpful. Um, and she's amazing. So back to this, microbiological environmental sampling. So generally it's not recommended because it's costly requires special laboratory procedures, and there is no standard for comparison, and may result in the implementation of unnecessary procedures or treatments. Um, because you, you, can find, you can find pathogens right about anywhere, but the, but the problem is how does that link back to how it's being transmitted to the patient? And that's why you have to make sure that your data is the thing that's guiding you um, in your environmental sampling, in your environmental um, sampling methods. So routine environmental monitoring, routine microbiological sampling for quality assurance purposes should be limited to A, biological monitoring of sterilization processes, B, monthly cultures and endotoxin testing of water and dialysate and hemodialysis units. There's, we have a whole dialysis chapter, it's great. Uh, C, short-term evaluation of the impact of infection prevention measures or changes in infection prevention protocols. So that means evaluating new cleaning procedures in our pro products or water culturing after legionella abatement. And then three, special environmental monitoring used when epidemiological investigations suggest 
a source or reservoir exists. You may monitor personnel, medical devices, air, water, food, or surfaces, and then quantitative methods should be used to determine the amount of burden. So, all very important information when it comes to microbiological environmental sampling. Really important, really great picture there. So question one, the director of the operating room requests that the OR surfaces be routinely environmentally cultured. The IP's best response should be, okay, a schedule for routine culturing of the OR should be arranged so that each room is culture, each room is cultures at a set interval, oh, is cultured at a set interval. B, route, routing, wait, routing. Routine culturing of the OR should be done in the absence of any epidemiologic investigations in that area. Area, Yeah, it should be routine. C, routine culturing should not be done because it is too expensive. Routine culturing, or D, routine culturing should not be considered unless an epidemiologic investigation is being conducted. So which one of these? Mm, good, I see that, I see the Heather story made a difference here. Very good, yes, routine culturing should not be considered unless an epidemiologic investigation is being conducted, absolutely, absolutely, because you don't, once you find it, what are you gonna do with that information? What is what 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 is that data really providing you? What is that, why, why would you do it to begin with? Okay, number two, important considerations regarding blood culture specimens should include, one, collect prior to the initiation of antimicrobial therapy, Two, collect from a central venous catheter whenever possible. Three, ensure that the volume of the specimen collected is sufficient. Or four, culture of specific sites is not recommended for surveillance. Okay. Very good for those of you who put A. Um, guys, come on. We got this. We got this as a group. Lots of A's. Excellent. Um, and yeah, you definitely don't want to collect from a central venous catheter. We know from our NHSN guidelines, it tells us that central lines have um, yield to higher contamination rates because we've got that foreign uh, catheter in our um, vascular system, cardiovascular system. And cultures of specific sites is not recommended for surveillance. So uh, one of the rules for NHSN is that you have to, it has to be site specific, right? So you have to, you have to, there have to be two separate preparations for the blood culture specimen collection for it to count. So you have to prepare two different sites. All right, question three, you receive a call from a young man who thinks he was exposed to HIV. His baseline HIV test was negative. At what time period after exposure would we be most likely to detect HIV antibodies? At what time period after exposure would we be most likely to detect HIV antibodies? So we've got our window period. We have to educate everyone, gets tested. Oof. Got lots of different answers. And the answer that's winning is not the correct one. Okay, so your window period is going to be one to three months. Your period, your window period is going to be one to three months. Um, yeah, well, it's, okay. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta remember that when it comes to um, HIV, you've got a window period. So when you're like, I used to work in an STD clinic as a disease intervention specialist. So whenever we would have people come and get tested, we would notify them like, hey, there's a window period for the transmission of HIV. So you really need to come back. If you're, if you're highly concerned for this, you need to come back and you need to be retested. Um, and we would tell them, you know, you've got one to three months, but that the, the recommendation is come back sometime within that window frame and if they came back at, at one month or at two months we would still tell them okay we'll come back after those those that window period of one to three months has passed again <clears throat> okay well this is the last one we still we had a couple more questions but we covered a lot today. Okay, so a physician orders a culture ova and parasite specimen on a 10 year old boy admitted with diarrhea 
A liquid stool specimen is collected from the patient at 9 p.m. The specimen is refrigerated until 9 a.m. the next day when the physician calls and requests that the lab look for amoebic trophozoites. The best course of action is to Okay, so the correct answer is going to be to request a fresh specimen. So for amoebic dysentery or amoebic dysentery is a type of dysentery caused by caused primarily by the amoeba, Entamoeba histo histo histolytica. Sorry. Histolytica. Amoebic dysentery is transmitted through contaminated food and water. Microscopic identification of cysts and trophozoites in the stool is the common method for diagnosing E. histolytica. This can be accomplished using a fresh stool, wet mounds, and permanently stained preparations like the trichrome stain, and then concentrates from fresh stool, wet mounds, with or without the iodine stain and permanently stained preparations like the trichrome. Okay, guys, this is where we're going to end today. Um, we covered a lot. If some of this material sounds really sounds odd, you were you were feeling lost, you were feeling like Ugh, some of these questions were a little hard. I really recommend you go back and read these chapters. I cannot stress the importance of chapters 24, 25, and 26. Okay, it, the material is really important for you to understand um, to do well in this section. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording now. Thank you so much. Uh, how do I stop? I never know how to stop this. Wait a minute. Okay, record. Stop your recording. Yes.